Hello, welcome back to Earth Materials. Today I want to spend some time talking about tectosilicates, framework silicates, and then a little bit on rock classification. So first I want to talk about silica polymorphs, quartz polymorphs. Then I want to talk about opal, feldspar, feldspar chemistry, and zeolites, zeolite structures. I'm not going to spend very much time on that. And rock classification. And at the end of this, I hope that students will be able to say something about how the silica polymorphs differ structurally and their broad stability fields. Is this a high pressure polymorph, low pressure, high temperature, low temperature? So at the end of this, I hope that students will be able to say something about how silica polymorphs differ structurally and their broad stability fields. So high pressure polymorphs, low pressure polymorphs, high temperature polymorphs, low temperature polymorphs. I hope there will be some basic understanding of how feldspathoid structures can be derived from silica structures, to have a basic understanding of feldspar structure and chemistry, to know a little bit about zeolite structure, and then to be able to classify rocks using a rock classification diagram. Okay, let's talk about silica polymorphs. There are many polymorphs of SiO2, so this is pressure versus temperature. At very high temperatures, of course, it'll melt and we get a liquid, but there are various polymorphs that are stable at ultra-high pressure, stichovite and coesite. At low pressure and temperature, we have alpha quartz stable. This is the kind of quartz that you see all the time. At elevated temperatures and low to moderate pressures, beta quartz is stable. This has hexagonal symmetry, this has trigonal symmetry. And at very low pressures and very high temperatures, there are the silica polymorphs tritomite and cristobalite. These all have different densities. At ultra-high pressures, the density of SiO2 is much, much higher than the densities at intermediate or very low pressures. Quartz, everybody loves quartz. It has a double helix structure, so two opposing but intertwined strands of silica tetrahedra. And alpha quartz has trigonal symmetry and beta quartz has hexagonal symmetry. So if we look down the c-axis, this is now alpha quartz, this is beta quartz, and just look at this shape right here. This has trigonal symmetry, but it does not have hexagonal symmetry. This line is shorter than this line. Beta quartz has true hexagonal symmetry. This is a perfect hexagon here. That's basically all that distinguishes alpha quartz from beta quartz. Just takes a little bit of kinking of the structure to turn alpha quartz into beta quartz. And in fact, that's why you can't find beta quartz on Earth today. Any quartz crystal that was beta quartz, as it cools off, will invert to alpha quartz. It's just too easy to shift from this hexagonal symmetry to trigonal symmetry. This gives you a sense of what these strands look like. So here is a spiraling strand of silica tetrahedra. So these are little solid tetrahedra. This is the same thing, just showing you this silicon with the oxygens around it, the way these silica tetrahedra are linked. And this is if you could see it as like little balls spinning around this vertical axis, the C-axis. Now, that's a single strand. It turns out they're actually double strands. So there's one strand that is following this spiral, and there is an opposing strand that is following this spiral. And so again, these are the three different ways that you might look at this solid tetrahedra, tetrahedra with the little silica cations in them, and here's the, the balls stuck together. But these are basically these two intertwined helices of silica tetrahedra. Now, one of the interesting things about quartz is that you can have left-handed quartz crystals and right-handed quartz crystals. So here you can see this is a left-handed strand. So as the strand moves upward along this axis, it's spinning to the left. This is right-handed. As this strand is moving upwards, it's spinning to the right. And you can see this in some quartz crystals when you look at their minor faces. So here is a left-handed quartz crystal. These faces, as you move upward in this direction, spin upward to the left. And this is a right-handed quartz crystal. These minor faces, as they move upward, spin to the right. Now, the story I always tell my students is that when I first met the woman who is now my wife, 
she knew I was into geology and she went out to a store and bought me a magnet that had a big quartz crystal on it. And me, ever the mineralogist, started explaining, oh, well, you know, there are left-handed quartz crystals and there are right-handed quartz crystals. And most quartz crystals are neither left-handed nor right-handed. But I, whenever I'm at a store, I always look for the left-handed quartz crystals. And so I started explaining it and I started looking at this quartz crystal. It was a beautiful example of a left-handed quartz crystal. So the one quartz crystal that she had picked out turned out to be left-handed. Now, cristobalite and tritomite are simply different ways of stacking hexagonal rings, and they have different symmetries. They can be either orthorhombic or hexagonal, tetragonal or isometric. But basically, what it comes down to is here are some sheets of silica tetrahedra. They're linked in these rings, and the question is simply, do they have this kind of symmetry with an up, down, up, down, up, down kind of distribution of the silica tetrahedra? Or do they have a more complicated arrangement of silica tetrahedra with a series of up-facing tetrahedra and down-facing tetrahedra arranged differently? Now, coesite and stichovite have rather interesting structures. This is the structure for coesite. It also contains silica tetrahedra, but it's unusual in that the silica tetrahedra are linked into four-membered chains rather than six-membered chains. So what that does is it compacts the structure and makes it a much denser mineral. Here's an image. This is a coesite inclusion. It has quartz around it inside a garnet. Oh, it's a nice little rutile crystal there with these radial fractures extending out from it. As the coesite inverts to form quartz, the volume expands considerably. This is a very compressed structure. So when we form these hexagonal rings in quartz, it expands and it blows apart the garnet. Stichovite is totally different. It has this octahedral coordination. If you remember back to one of the earlier lectures, I mentioned the structure of rutile. Rutile has these chains of octahedra that are linked together in the same form. And so this is a very similar structure between stichovite and rutile. So instead of TiO2 for rutile, this is SiO2 for stichovite. And of course, having octahedrally coordinated silica is very unusual and occurs only at ultra high pressures. So this is a very unusual configuration with octahedrally coordinated silica. OK, quick question. Which of the following is not true about silica polymorphs? And the answer is they do not have an interlayered cation. Most of them do have six-membered rings. You can have left and right. This is octahedrally coordinated. And these very low pressure polymorphs have very low densities. OK, so I hope at this point you can say a little bit about silica polymorphs, how they differ structurally in a very broad sense, and then their broad stability fields. Like, which ones would you expect to be at really high pressure, low pressure, intermediate pressure? OK, now I want to talk a little bit about opal. Opal is an unusual mineral. It has an unusual spherical form. It can be amorphous, or it could consist of little microcrystals of cristobalite and tritomite. But mostly, opal forms these little spheres. They're called leptospheres. And the size and the packing of the spheres dictates light refraction and color. So here is a scanning electron microscope image of opal, an opal surface. And you can see these little spheres. These spheres are packed in regular arrays, and these regular arrays can diffract light. Now, the color of the light that you see depends on how big these spheres are and how they pack together. And clearly, when you look at natural opals, they have a range of colors, which means that there are some sections where the spheres are larger and other sections where the spheres are smaller. When you actually look very closely at these spheres, you can see that they consist of these little microcrystals that are all packed together. But it's this packing of the spheres that creates the light refraction. 
So at this point, just very generally, I hope students would be able to explain how opal structure causes color. I do want to take a brief digression to talk about feldspathoids. Feldspathoids are minerals that form in very low silica rocks. They're not very common minerals, but the more common ones are leucite, nepheline, and sodalite. Sodalite is this blue mineral here. They have rings of silica tetrahedra, very similar to tritomite, and there are these cations that are stuck into the middles of these rings. Now you can't just put a sodium ion in here and have it charge balanced. So what's happening is you're sticking a sodium ion in here and you're changing one of these silica tetrahedra into an aluminum tetrahedron. So this is how nepheline is formed. You put a bunch of sodium in there. Leucite, which is closer to end member composition, calcite, you put a potassium in the middle of this ring. And then similarly for sodalite, adding sodium and substituting aluminum. Okay, let's spend some time talking about feldspar chemistry. Feldspars are a little weird too. They consist of four membered rings of silica and aluminum tetrahedra. So here is a four membered ring, silica and aluminum. Here's another four membered ring. Here's another four membered ring and so on. These rings are arranged in this back and forth ribbon structure. So here's a four membered ring, another one, another one, another one. So they go back and forth like this. And there's this big open space in here where the strands separate from each other and a narrower space where the strands approach each other. This means that there's a big open space in here and this is where an alkali ion, sodium, potassium, calcium can go. And so that's what you see. If you look at this structure, you find these big open areas. That's where the alkali cations go. There are two main types of feldspars. There's the plagioclase feldspars, which are a solid solution between albite and anorthite. And there are the alkali feldspars, which are a solid solution between albite and orthoclase. Alkali feldspars are commonly called K-spar or K-feldspar and abbreviated this way. Although, strictly speaking, they can have a lot of sodium in them too. There are three different potassium feldspars that can form. High temperature potassium feldspars called sanidine, intermediate temperature orthoclase, low temperature microcline. These differ in terms of their structure and also the ordering of silicon and aluminum into those tetrahedra. Although the alkali feldspars can form these solid solutions, they can also separate out two different alkali feldspars if they are cooled slowly enough. And so these images are of the mineral amazonite, which is a lead-bearing potassium feldspar. The blue areas are more potassium rich, and you can see these thin white lines here. You can see it really well in this, in this jewelry. The thin white areas are more sodium rich. The blue-green areas are more potassium rich. And you can see this in plagioclase. Sometimes you have to go to a transmission electron microscope to see it. But this is an intergrowth of a more sodium-rich plagioclase feldspar and a more calcium-rich plagioclase feldspar. And it's this separation of more calcium and more sodium-rich feldspar that can cause diffraction of light and create the Schiller effect these blue and green colors that we see in the mineral labradorite. Okay, which of the following is not true about feldspars? And the answer is they do not form six-membered rings of silica tetrahedra. That's typical of the silica polymorphs, like quartz, alpha quartz, tritomite, cristobalite, that kind of thing. Okay, so at this point I hope you can explain a little bit about feldspar structure and chemistry. We will get into what causes X solution in a different lecture. Okay, now I'd like to spend a little time talking about zeolites. Zeolites have compositions that are very similar to feldspars, but they have these quite interesting structures. And I won't go into all of the details of all of the zeolites. There are many, many zeolites. But basically, they have these open channels, or they can have these cavities. 
and the channels have particular sizes to them. Now this makes zeolites really useful for certain types of industrial applications. So here for example if we have this ring structure with this particular diameter it would allow an organic compound with this shape to pass through but it would not allow an organic compound with this shape to pass through. And so it can actually filter out organic compounds that we may not want and allow organic compounds that we do want to pass through. So you can see these can have these sort of funny three-dimensional cavity shapes. They can have tube structures that run through them. This thing sort of looks like a little climbing gear with, you know, your legs could go through here and your torso up here and so on. They make really beautiful crystals, scolocyte, still bite, still bite plus apophyllite. Here's some apophyllite and hulandite. Okay, so just a little bit on zeolite structure and its practical uses. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is igneous rock classification. The reason I bring it up in the context of this lecture is because felsic rock classification is based on the proportions of tectosilicates, particularly quartz up here, alkali feldspar, potassium feldspar, and plagioclase down here. And so this is just based on proportions. If you have, for example, what would this be, 40% quartz, and 60% plagioclase and no alkali feldspar, you would have a rock that we would classify as a tonalite. If it has less than 20% quartz and less than 5% potassium feldspar, we would call this a diorite. If it has intermediate proportions of quartz, alkali feldspar, and plagioclase, we would call this a Monza granite, or granites are really this whole field here. If it has less quartz, it would be called a quartz monzonite, and if it's just a mixture of alkali feldspar and plagioclase, then we would call it a monzonite. Now, this is the top of this diagram. Often there's another part of the diagram that shows up below this, and this is for feldspathoids, so they're quartz absent. So these rocks also contain alkali feldspar, plagioclase, and then a feldspathoid. Sometimes these are just called foids. So for example, up here we had a monzonite, which is a mixture of alkali feldspar plagioclase and little to no quartz. Here we would call this a foid-bearing, feldspathoid-bearing monzonite, which also contains alkali feldspar and plagioclase. But instead of having a little bit of quartz, like a monzonite, it has a little bit of feldspathoid in it. And then if there's more feldspathoid, then it has these other classification names. As I said, there are lots of igneous classification schemes. Here's one for mafic rocks for the proportions of clinopyroxene, orthopyroxene, and plagioclase, here just listed as anorthite. Along the left-hand side are gabbros. Along the right-hand side is a rock that we call a norite. It has no clinopyroxene, but has orthopyroxene and plagioclase. And there are various other rock names that occupy the, the middle of the diagram. Ultramafic rocks are defined in terms of the proportions of olivine, clinopyroxene, and orthopyroxene. Peridotites are basically up here, something that has a lot of olivine in it. Rocks down here that have less olivine are called websterites or peroxonites, and, and so on. Now, that's just for the plutonic igneous rocks. There is also a volcanic igneous rock classification scheme, and you can see here for felsic rocks, it also corresponds with the quartz K feldspar, plagioclase, feldspathoid, corners, and these just have different names. So instead of having a tonalite over here, it would be a dacite. And instead of having a diorite down here, it's called an andesite, and so on. Okay, so at this point, if I gave you proportions of phases, I hope you'd be able to look on a diagram and figure out what you would name that rock. All right, thanks.